Awesome. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here. Uh, second time in Poland. It's nice to be back. Um, I'm Marco, this guy. I run around with that avatar, and my first job is bothering people on Twitter. And in the free time, I work as a consultant. And I write dangerous software. Is anybody using Zen Framework or Doctrine? Right? Don't. <laughs> it's dangerous. <laughs> All right? I'm just kidding, all right? I work for a company called Rove. We are consultants. Hit us up if you need any help. And we are awesome. Um, so yeah, this I work with an awesome team, and they're all very knowledgeable. I contribute to Doctrine and Zen Framework. And today, we're going to talk about the first project. Thank you. All right. Questions? OK, gonna, gonna, okay let, let's skip. OK, it's, it's fine. It's, I'm not running away. They, they paid for everything here, so I have to actually speak. So what the hell is doctrine? Okay, I need to do this every time and just to rehearse. I know that most of you will probably already use it, so I'm going to pretty much do the basics for now. So doctrine is actually not the ORM. It's a incubator. It's a wider project. It's about persistence. We do anything that has to do with saving and loading things. Um, I am actually looking for people. If anybody wants to help with Doctrine and you think you have the knowledge and you think you have also the guts to say no to feature creep or to take decisions that may be unpopular but very useful on the long run, please contact me. It's, it's good to have more people that help us. So what the heck is Doctrine or M, uh, Doctrine 2 or M? Um, okay, so an object relational mapper, first of all, and this must be very clear. This means that it takes your objects and your relational database and connects them together. Uh, it takes and persists everything based on pretty much the API of Hibernate. So we took the ideas of Hibernate and made them our own. So it's nothing new. Um, and the Hibernate guys actually appreciate that we mentioned them. And it's based on a database abstraction layer, so you don't need to change everything in your application because you want to support different databases. It just works out of the box. And it saves and loads something called Popo through um, SQL. So what is the plain old PHP object? P -P Popo, PHP uh, plain object. That is pretty much something that you designed in your application. It does something. You don't know what it does. But the point is there is your logic, your decisions in there. Right. What we do is we take this object, we push it somewhere else, and we deal with it. Uh, actually, Doctrine deals with it, but um, the idea is that if you code like this, then uh, your plain old PHP objects enable you to do something called domain-driven development. It's not necessarily correlated, but it actually makes it easier. Now, the idea is that your code is free of any frameworks and stuff like that. You just put it in later. Now, this is a big lie because obviously there will be some things that don't work, but um, you don't really need the ORM for this, but it helps. It helps a bit. So this is not a talk about DDD. Uh, there is a mailing list for that. I can suggest it. If you want to know more about DDD, there is an awesome mailing list, which is called DDD in PHP. You can look it up. I think it's DDD in PHP, uh, org. Is it Matthias actually here? Matthias Veres? Ah, he's not here. He's in the other room still doing his tutorial, I think. So um, how you use this tool, and obviously this is basics. So if you know this already, please don't fall asleep. Um, the Entity Manager pretty much is your central point in the application. You can persist things. You kind of say save it. You can flush everything, which means pretty much commit a transaction. You can find, which means load. And you can remove stuff. So let's take an example and see what the point of this stuff is and why is it so complicated and so complex? Why do I have to map all this stuff? Here's an example. Um, this is pretty typical. So let's say that we design this into different tables. Okay? Let's say that we did some table-based design for our application. And now we have an address, a customer, an invoice, a line item, and a product, all with their own relations. So the customer can't exist without an address. The invoice can't exist without the customer and the line items. And the line items can't exist 
without the product. Or well, it can exist with the product. But. All right, so this means that anytime you do an insert to save all this, you're gonna do a series of operations in a very precise order, all right? And it, so first of all, you need to save the address because it's your first dependency. Then you need to save the customer, make sure the customer exists. I'm doing everything in one shot here, so just for the sake of the example. Then you need to create the invoice, and assuming your products are already in the database because you're not going to create the products during a checkout, um, then you create the line items. So this pretty much is the loop. And it is freaking complicated. Let's, let's do it with SQL just for a second. So first of all, I save the address. I insert some stuff. This is a talk that I gave in Brno. I should have adapted it, but I didn't know the address here. We didn't actually find the place until, no, I'm just kidding. But it's in the, indeed in the middle of nowhere here, but it's a big venue. So we save the address, first of all. Um, then we save the user. Uh, so I'm going to use the last insert ID in my SQL. So you see there's dependent operations. The order is depending on the previous operation. Um, now I'm going to save the invoice, which is again using the last insert ID. Now I didn't make it very complicated, but the idea is that I just use now as the date. And then I save the line items. So let's say that I have two line items that I insert in the invoice. That's going to be it. So the point is that this order of operation in sequence is what causes bugs, because it's one of those time-based dependencies. Your operations are depending on each other. They're not really having a, a directed uh, set of you, you can code it in code, but if you code it in a a procedural way you have a top-down execution of everything and it's gonna be very messy if you just move one operation up or down so this is what you would do instead with a, a tool like this so what you do is you just create your your user and the address for it and then you create you find the product one and product two assuming they're there and then you create a new invoice with the user product one and product two then you persist everything in theory just on the invoice and flush. So this makes it easier, right? The point is that. It also comes with transactionality, so you don't have to deal with all the errors, which means that if something fails while you try to save everything, it's going to crash, which is exactly what you want. It's going to roll back. So this is all cool, all very nice, but it comes at, at, at a very high cost, which pretty much makes the ORM slow. Okay, and anybody here having performance issues with the Symfony app because of the ORM? All right, I see a few hands up. Yeah, somebody like agitating their hand there, back there. All right, so they are slow, okay? Uh, there, I said it. Um, I'm sorry if we're solving your problems. <laughs> but uh, is it actually that, or is it the problem that nobody actually took care and looked into why this is the case? This is the case in many, many, many uh, occasions, but most of the time it's usually tool misuse. So this is where I kind of focus myself when talking about this. Any abstraction has a cost. Anything that you want to push down to machine level to make it faster um, is going to be less abstracted. So the point is that these tools like the ORM, they come with this cost and the cost is always abstraction and performance. You get either less abstraction or more performance. Um, it's kind of difficult to get both, unless you have like millions and millions of uh, euros or a slotty to spend on that. So, yeah. So this is why these tools usually come with uh, a leaky abstraction. So what we allow is, and this is a quote from Kevin King, which is the pretty much the initial author of Hibernate ORM. It is intentionally designed in such a way that you can go down multiple levels and break all the rules and just do something that would be otherwise very, very slow. So there's APIs for every different use case, which is the first step that you need to understand. And I say the talk is about, obviously, this tool being faster, but we'll get to that in a few, um, mainly with a small live demo. So. The point is, why would you hit a screw with a hammer or like 
use nails with a screwdriver doesn't really make sense, right? This doesn't work. In PHP, it works. Uh, this is this actually exists. Uh, I, I need a copy or something. It must be awesome. Um, so you can use this API. It kind of works, but this is where you're going to ha have the typical performance issues. Um, so what you do here is you create, you find a user, uh, you remove it, then you persist something, and then you flush. This is going to cause one query for fetching, one query for removing the user. So it's going to select it, then delete it after selecting it, because you may want to acquire a lock or whatever. Then it's saving something else, and then it's flushing. So it may cause a lot of operations. Uh, you may use just the find operation on a repository. You can customize that, or use the find by, which is also quite slow if you didn't have an index on there. Which means that you need to know the SQL stuff, because if you forgot an index and you do a find by there, you're going to have a bad day. So you can use the object-oriented version of the traversal. So here we get the user, and then we get the address, and get the city from the address. So this, this is a hidden query. For those who are familiar with the tool, whenever you call user get address, that is going to give you something that is called a fake object, a proxy. And whenever you call anything on that thing, it is going to cause a DB query. So it's like hidden. You have DB queries all over the place, and it's going to make a bit of a mess. On the other side, it kind of works cleanly with your domain, so you don't need to worry about expressing things in the way your business ex expresses them. Um, to work around that and get a bit deeper into um, kind of non-object-oriented APIs, we get something like a criteria API. This is a not-object-oriented API mostly because what we're doing here is we are accessing state inside our objects instead of using their API to filter them. So what I have here is a, a date time, which is minus 18 years. This is 18 years ago. And then I create a criteria, which is just kind of a filter. And then I say criteria and where the birthday is smaller than that particular, uh, birthday, uh, that particular date time. And that is going to give me all the adults in my record set. I don't know if in Poland there's still 18, but that's for me in my domain, the um, other sets. So there is a query language. So this is kind of a meta language. It's pretty much SQL, but the advantage is that you are going to um, be able to have type hinting and type strictness on this. This is the point of this language. This language prevents you from doing mistakes such as loading things in, a, in an order that is not really what was designed. So you're going down levels and levels. You're going into non-object-oriented API. Now we're connecting objects together that don't really fit together. We're filtering stuff in a non-object-oriented uh, way. This is what I want to really make clear. This is not object-oriented code. Object relational mappers are not object-oriented because Object orientation is about object communicating with each other, whereas we are just really reading state and doing things with it. You can go further down. So this is a recursive query. I'm building it with something called the native SQL component. So you see we're going to drop down traps, traps, traps until we reach the bare metal. This is the SQL stuff. So this works only on PostgreSQL. And what this query is doing is it's computing the sum of all the numbers uh, below 100. So what I'm getting is just the sum of all the numbers, executing the query and getting the result. So if you have some operation that has to be executed by the SQL engine at low level, you're going to use something like this. So you need to know some internals to understand where these tools are actually useful and where they actually make it slow. So you need to know pretty much how it's built, at least, kind of the ideas behind it. So first of all, one concept that needs to be clear is that the, the tool, what it's doing is it's fetching records from the database and putting them into your objects. So the ORM hydrates and extracts data from objects. So the hydration process is pretty much from record set to objects. So it looks kind of like this. You have some kind of amorph data structure, comes from a query, comes from, I don't know, a cache or something like that. You put it into an object. 
This happens in serializers as well, extraction as well. So you are reading data from an object into a different data structure that is more flat. Um, is anybody using JMS serializer? Right, a few hands up. Uh, if you know JMS serializer, you also know how slow it gets when you got a lot of API calls on any endpoint that is using that thing to uh, transform data into JSON, for example. Another thing that must be really clear is that anything that you are going to read is going to stay in memory. And that is because the ORMs are the pretty much useful for online transaction processing applications. This means applications that just do a checkout, a payment, operate with small amounts of records, complex business logic going on there, but we're not dealing with a million records and putting it together. So anything that you read is kept in memory so that you don't do a second query when you want to fetch an object. Because the rule is that at any point in time, for one particular identifier and type of object, you are going to have only one instance inside a single transaction. And that is by design this way. So it prevents you from loading the same object multiple times. This is pretty much what happens behind. You have this entity manager thing. We saw what you do with it. Then you have in the middle this unit of work and then um, the database. And the unit of work is between you and the database and it keeps everything that you did in memory and keeps track of all what you're doing. So it prevents you from like saving things that don't need to be saved and it prevents you from loading things that don't need to be loaded. But when you want to save, what happens is that this unit of work, everything in it, is going to be traversed top down and it's going to check everything. So this is the flush operation. So the entire unit of work is read top down, okay? And it's going to check did this change, did this, this other thing, uh, thing change, and so on. So it's pretty much like this. So you can think of a unit of work as a loaded cargo like this. And now it gets somewhere and we want to commit, like get to a port somewhere. And a person jumps on the ship and starts looking into every container on every label and check, do you want to deliver it here, right? It's as if we did that. It is a very expensive operation. It simplifies your life. You just put stuff on a ship, you don't care, right? It's just going on the ship. And then on the other side, somebody has to make the work and go over all of it and check it. So the point is, it's going to simplify things. As I said, it keeps only one object in memory per time. Uh, it avoids you to do any, a, a big amount of queries. So this means that your, at least your server, uh, SQL server, is going to be a bit relieved by this. But on your side, it's going to have a very slow and uh, CPU and memory intensive PHP application. So other things that must be clear, object must stay in a valid state. URM doesn't deal with the state problems like saving things that is invalid is just going to crash or it's going to cause any big issues on the unit of work. And I see a lot of people operating and changing data inside the ORM once it's inside. It shouldn't happen like this. There are a few strategies that you can use to simplify all this and make it less painful to deal with. So caching, first of all. Caching is at the core of the architecture of the ORM. Um, it's pretty much built in. You can't work without it. It does, doesn't even make sense to run the ORM without it. So you should really consider using it. Uh, has four caches. First one is the metadata cache. You really want to, do, to use this. This is pretty much a piece of code that takes all these rules from plain old PHP objects to data structure and caches all the bridges between them. So if you're translating from one, synth one format to the other, it's the metadata cache that is operating in, between in the middle. Um, a query cache, so anything that is like a DQL query, the syntax above, is translated into SQL at some point. And this operation is very costly because it depends on how your objects look like, it depends on how your DB looks like, and it um, also is to be parsed. And yeah, it, it gets very complicated there. There's a lot of string manipulation and um, very complicated operations going on. So what happens is that we take the string above, the string below, cache it, and put them together somewhere. Result cache, uh, this is not to be enabled by default. And that is because caching, obviously, 
really works well only for immutable data, but not really for stuff like this. So um, here I'm just enabling the cache and saying it's going to be lasting for three hours or something like that. So you really want to use this very carefully. Now what we did new is the second level cache. Um, does anybody know what a second level cache is in a CPU? Come on, hands up. In a CPU, in a com computer, in a central processing unit. Ever heard of a second level cache? All right, couple of hands, there we go. So uh, this is new, so it's kind of new also to all the Symfony users that don't follow closely. Um, and it's new as of Doctrine 2.5. So it's, it's quite the biggest addition so far. And that's where I want to bang my head on because many, many people iterate and do operations that are very inefficient in the ORM systems. But um, this becomes very, very efficient then with this component turned on. So the point is that an ORM, uh, uh, sorry, an SQL database is very slow at, ca at operations like this. So what we're doing is we're just selecting from some table via ID that is a direct hit. This is what no SQL databases like uh, uh, MongoDB, CouchDB, and other web scale databases are very fast at. Okay, you lose all the transactionality or whatever. There are some that are transactionals, but the point is these operations are slow in relational databases most of the time. You have some parsing to do. You don't have a dedicated API to just fetch a record by ID. Um, so yeah, it's, it's quite messy, it's, it's slow. So what we are doing is we are providing a way to make this operation, specifically this one, much faster. So what is a second level cache? A second level cache in a computer, and this is very simplistic, actually this is nicer, it's colored, is it's actually something very simple. You have on the right input output devices that are slow and stuff like that then in theory you have a level of RAM in, the in, in between which I skipped for simplicity here and then you have this level 2 cache this level 2 cache is just usually a small amount of RAM inside your CPU but it's really fast so it's very expensive to produce usually this cache uh, because it's running at very high frequencies but it's so close to the CPU that the electric current has to travel so little that it's very fast to access it. And then there's also level one cache, which is super fast, but it's like really inside the CPU. So this is pretty much what happens. Now, if we put it together, it's pretty much fitting what we designed in Doctrine. Um, so the entity manager is our CPU. The unit of work is our level one cache, which means it's very close to the CPU, but it's very expensive to produce and it gets filled up really quick. The level two cache is much further away, but it's larger. And then we have the database. So we just added a layer in between. And then you just say, I want to use APC, Redis, MongoDB, whatever you prefer. And that is where your uh, records are going to be cached when you fetch them and so on. So how does it fetch? Uh, how does it work? You have um, pretty much anything that um, any state that um, is going to the DB is going to be written also to the cache and anything coming from the DB is also going to go to the cache. It's very simple. So the assumption though is that only the RM is, is the tool that is writing to the DB. So you don't have a secondary systems having access to the system. And uh, this usually doesn't work in corporates because everyone wants access to your DB for whatever reason. Uh, so it's a big assumption, but if you have decision power on your application, then you should enforce at least something like this, or at least know that you are the only person that is writing to the DB. So setting it up um, is just for the users that already use the ORM. So when you set it up, and I don't know the, the, the Symfony or other stuff, that is using it, but you just use something like this. You have your configuration object that it comes from the uh, ORM tool chain, and then you just uh, enable the second level cache, and then you create the cache region. Cache region is just a system to, um, 
to do how, wh where to save what. So you want to save user here, uh, users here, and you want to save ACLs here, and you want to save blog posts in this other um, cache structure. So you just enable it like this, and in this case, we use a Redis cache there. So it's quite a simple API. And then you just mark your entities as cacheable, because caching by default is a very bad idea, right? Caching, caching is one of the two very difficult things in computer programming, which are naming things, caching, and counting things, right? Um, so yeah, you mark it as cacheable. In this case, I say non-strict read-write, which you can ignore for now. I'll get back to this. Um, well. Actually, I'm going to go over this now. So you can cache it in different modes. First, on, first one is read-only. This means that anything that is overwritten in your cache will just throw an exception. You can't overwrite it. So it's perfect for immutable data. Read-write uh, is pretty much emulating the transaction system of the uh, DB. So we are locking the records. So it may be very slow. But it works really well for systems where you don't overwrite data very often. And then non-strict read-write, which pretty much means this is Wild West. Do whatever the, uh, you want, all right? So um, regions, I'm just finishing with the slides. We'll go to some demo here now. So you just have different structures going to different systems. You may want to save users into memcache. You may want to save uh, ACLs into a file. And you may want to save other information in Redis. So that's up to you. This is fine tuning. Right, let's see a bit uh, of demo stuff. Let me change this screen alignment. All right. Did I crash it again? Oh, this happened this morning as well. I need to reboot. I'm not kidding. Mac OS is so reliable. I need to actually reboot, yeah? I'm not kidding. I'll do that. Yeah, no, never mind. I'm not doing the live demo on the projector. I can't type there. All right. So. There we go. Well, there we go. Um, there we go. That's better. Right. Oh, come on, guys. Please. So, uh, right. I'm going to run the examples directory in a local web server. I run PHP 7. That's just to, my, to make it more stable, right? Um, and I just need to uh, run the slides as well, uh, which are grunt server. Right. That seems about right. So. Um, this should be 5555, insert, uh, run insert. No, I don't want the password, thanks. Ah, stability, modern tool chain, 2015, we can't get a presentation without switching monitors, right? So, um, if you can read any of this, and I'm gonna hide anything that is not necessary, so you have a run insert operation. So what I'm doing here is very simple. I'm just saving a user. I'm just assigning a username and saving the user. And I have this bootstrap script. And this bootstrap script is simply setting up all my caching setup. This, this is pretty much all the cache setup that you saw on slides. Um, I'm just pretty much adding a cache logger, which is useful for profiling. So in live, in production systems, on some of the systems, you may want to have some of these loggers to see what kind of queries are still being executed and which ones are instead going to the cache, 
which is really useful to fine-tune performance. Then we create the entity manager. Then I'm lazy, so I'm recreating the schema at every page load. Um, so just just not bothered by, by creating it via SQL. And then I'm adding an, an SQL logger that just outputs everything to console. So this helps me to see what is going on. Uh, all right, let's see. I'm going to delete everything here. All right, so this is a fresh DB. And it's going to run in run insert. So run insert starts a transaction, insert the user with a value inside the uh, DB. So these are the um, the value and the type of the value. So it's a string, and it commits. So we see we have three queries here, and then we have some information from a second level cache, right? And this second level cache information is telling us that I inserted in the cache. Um, a user object with ID 1. Um, and then we have some hits, miss, and put count. So this is going to tell us how much the cache was used, which is useful for us uh, for profiling purposes. Now, we have a run select. Run select will tell us that it found a user. Uh, this, square, this, this operation is pretty much um, the opposite of the previous one. I'm going to see if I can show it. Yeah. So it's pretty much just doing this. It's going to um, take my user, find it, and dump it. And that's it. And it's just going to show us some caching information. Now, this operation is interesting because there are no queries shown. And this is because my cache pretty much prevented me from going to the database at all. So I'm going to clear the cache for now. All right, Delete everything and reload the page. As you see, it's running the query now. And now I have a put count of one, so something got written to the cache. And next request, I don't have the query anymore. And instead, I have a hit count of one. So now I can pretty much refresh as much as I want. This is never going to the database, which is cool. You now pretty much got rid of most of the queries to your database just with one shot. It's not going to remove all of them, of course, but still makes it quite nice. Um, we have more complicated stuff, actually. So here I have an insert with something different. So I'm creating a collection of car of sorry of users on a car. So I'm creating a car, setting the users. I'm using public properties just for simplicity. Save the car and flush. So let's see. Uh, run insert car. All right. It is going to show me some information here. It's going to insert something in the car table. And then it's going to insert into the join table between car and user some values. And then you have some, you have the dump of the object. So you have the car, and then you have all this information, which is hidden inside the ORM. It's ugly as heck, but you don't need to know about it. And then you have cache, cache statistics. So now you have a hit count of 0, a miss count of 1, because there, were, there was no entry for the um, for the user and card join table, and then a put count of count of three. So this means that now the ORM fetched on one uh, one side it, it fetched the new car object, got it an ID assigned, and put it in the cache. Then put in the cache the association with the user and the join table entries. So now the ORM is emulating all the SQL level hops. So when I run the run select car stuff, it's going to tell me that a car was found. And then you see there's loads of information about this collection. And then you say it's going to show the users in the car. And you see it hit two times, miscount and put count of zero. No queries. So if I remove the cache, again, I'm going to evict manually the cache. So this is pretty much going to cause the queries to be shown again. So this operation is actually usually selecting a, a car. And then by traversal, it's going to select the user details. So it's pretty much useful to get rid of this stuff. It's just operations in your st inside your domain. They're very normal operations, but they cause a lot of traffic on your database. So you just reload. And now it's pretty much going to only have hits and no misses. This is pretty much natural, uh, a natural improvement to your application. So anything that you can put in cache that is kind of not high concurrency, you should really. So 
that is pretty much it for the live demo. So let's see. Right. So this is quite awesome. It took us nine months to build it. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry, it, it took a lot of time and we're proud of it. And um, it took a lot of time designing it and actually lots of time to also look at what the Hibernate guys do, did because they built it first, all right? It works e exactly the same in Java system. So the conclusion is pretty much that doctrine is web scale, okay? Um, that's not the right conclusion, all right? I'm just kidding here. At least it's as transactional as MongoDB now. Um, so the point is you saw the tools, all right? You saw how to use them. You saw that you can have, say, performance improvements if you want them. But please don't do this, okay? This is something that I fix in every second project. This happens in every second project that I see that is done by persons that pretty much build something to show it and then put it in production. And then they wonder why two months later their system is so slow. So this is fetching all the users, then traversing them, and for every user, filter it if it's approved. This doesn't need to be in an object doesn't need to be build, built in an object oriented way. And this is slow even with the cache enabled. So just don't do it. So when I see this, I usually am like this, or I don't know, it's just, it's just not working. That's not how it's <laughs> done, right? That's not how you use it. I, it's, it's just built wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you know the tool, you know how to use it. You need to know also when to not use an ORM. So it makes not sense to use the ORM for all the stuff that SQL is really great at. Reporting, a huge amount of data. Sometimes when it's too huge, then SQL is even the wrong tools, but there's other tools for that. And dynamic types and stuff that changes all the time that is really squishy and problematic to deal with. There's no SQL for that as well. So don't use an ORM for that. So the point I want to make is we work on this a lot. We try to fix your problems. We can also help you out figuring out your problems. So in my opinion, you just need to know what you're doing. So thank you for listening. There's the joined in link there, so you can rate it. It's actually just on the conference where page on joined in. And thank you very much. Are there any questions? Come on. No? Yeah? Yes. Um, okay, does the second level cache work also well the with the array hydrator? Okay, the second level cache is between the object hydrator and the database queries. So this means that it is going to work only when you deal with objects. So when you want to get an array back from your result set, then it's not going to interfere with that. In that case, instead of using the second level cache, you just should use the result cache. Result cache would work there. So it's pretty much between hydration and the database queries, which means that it also makes hydrations around six times faster, which is also a big gain for us. Any other questions? I guess that's fine. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>